Everybody and welcome to another episode of Be Your Own Loud. Uh, many years ago, 10 years ago, I got introduced to our guest today this way, which is my two children, who, by the way, are still not as tall as Nate, but <laughs> much, much bigger than this right now, where I got introduced to Nate as Big Easy with the Harlem Globetrotters. And still to this day, my kids remember that experience as a life-changing experience. But we're going to talk a lot more than just about the Globetrotters because we're going to talk to Nate today about life, basketball, his embracing of just how to live life to the fullest, and the fact that he has maintained being an amazing overall human being through a lot of trials and tribulations. So Nate, Welcome to the show. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, I start off this the the show with the same question to everybody, which is, tell me your story. How did you get to be where you are today? Um, my story. Um, well, I'm known as as you know Nate Big Easy Lofton, so that means Big Easy. I grew up in New Orleans. Uh, I was born uh, April 15, 1981, Charity Hospital. Um, everybody from New Orleans know that's called the City Zoo. Um, it's a different place. Um, you know, um, my mom, my dad, you know, both of them had to drop out of school early. My mom actually did finish high school um, when they was young. My dad had to drop out of school when he was 11 years old to um, take care of his grandparents, you know, his parents. Um, you know, he hustled. He sold drugs and, 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 and did whatever he can do um, at, at, you know, at 11. You know, he was in sixth grade. He dropped out of school. I couldn't imagine I couldn't imagine that at all. Um, so he did what he had to do, you know, he, so he sold drugs, you know, hustled and, and did everything he could. Um, at the age of 20, him and my mom had me. Um, my dad actually went to jail um, for three or four years, um, you know, from doing his, his, his things. He was going in the street to uh, be an uneducated black man trying to, trying to pay the bills. Um, he went to jail. Um, he was supposed to do a lot of time. He want, he wound up not doing no, not doing that time. Came home. Um, my mom had uh, had my brother by then. Um, my dad got got home and you know told you know my brother's father that hey he's back. He wasn't that was supposed to come back, but he's back now. So my dad was you know he was back home in the picture. So he didn't sell any more drugs um, after that that day when he came home. He wanted to do better, but unfortunately he did get addicted to drugs and uh, and alcohol. Um, so, you know, growing up, you know, grew up in the projects of New Orleans in the nineties, murder capital of the world. Um, it was the toughest time to, to be, you know, a young kid, you know, growing up in the neighborhood I grew up in. Um, I, I enjoyed it though. It wasn't, that's not a sad thing to say. Like, um, I didn't know I was poor. I didn't know I was broke. Uh, I didn't understand the violence and the murder and everything I was seeing. I thought that was the normal thing that everybody was doing you know, around the, around the world, around the country, you know, but. So for me, I, I was lucky. I grew up. I had my mother and father in the same household. And growing up, it was probably you know a bunch of us in the neighborhood in the projects. And I was literally me and my brother was the only one to have a two parent home. Mm -hmm. So maybe you know even though my dad was on drugs and 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 you know you know he worked his butt off. He was a longshoreman. He went to work every day. You know, you know drugs and not alcohol or not. He went to work every day, 12, 14 hours shifts, working on the river, um, on chicken boats and stuff, things like that, to make sure we we, we had the, the basics, you know? And um, seeing that work that, you know, even though he was going through so much, you know, I, I couldn't imagine mentally, but so much just, just as a man trying to navigate everything, uneducated, you know, with a sixth grade education, um, he did all right. You know, he did all right. Um, you know, my, my brother, he was managing restaurants and in the in the airport before you know um the pandemic and now he's a gm for the buffalo wild wings you know, i'm in the west bank of new orleans and of course you know i'm doing what i'm doing so i, I think 
my dad, you know, he passed away a couple of years back, so I think he would be happy with his struggle. But anyway, um, yeah, so I just grew up in the, in the 90s. I grew up tough. I saw a lot, you know. I think I might saw my first murder at six, seven years old, um, something like that, and it just never stopped. Um, you know, that stuff, you know, it, it makes you tough. It, it makes you um, think different in life. And with the things you look at, you look at them real different from your normal 9, 10, 11 year old, you know, uh, the decisions I was making at 13 or 14, it wasn't this, oh, if I do this, you know, I might get grounded. I might, you know, get punished. I might lose my allowance. It's like, no, if I walk through that courtyard, I might die. And I was as simple as that. So, uh, you know, I'm very calculated in everything I do um, since then. And, and it's because of that upbringing. Um, went to, I played ball, um, played um, bitty ball, basketball. Um, that, that that was pretty cool. Um, didn't get to play AAU ball because um, I had to work summertime um, to pay for the uniforms when school come back. You know, once I got to a certain age, once I got to 14, 15, everybody started playing AAU basketball, you know, summer league, travel league, whatever. We couldn't afford that. We couldn't afford it at all. Um, so I had to work to pay for the uniforms for me and my little brother. Uh, once my dad got injured at work. And, um, yeah, and, you know, just 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 understood life early. Um, had to understand how to take care of my family early. Um, when I was like 16, 17, my dad got hurt. You know, as I said, he was a longshoreman working on the river, um, working at the bottom of chicken boats. A guy almost got hit by a, like a, a massive um, roll of paper. Um, it almost, it was falling on him and my dad pushed him and saved him. But it clipped my dad's um, foot, uh, almost severed it off. It didn't know. So he couldn't work um, for a little bit. Uh, my mom had to stop working to help him heal up. And that was right when I was supposed to go off to college. Mm. Um, So I had to turn down the scholarships. um, And I was like, you know, six, five, six, six, um, had a couple of scholarships, Um, turned those down and I went to work. I worked um, at Acme Oyster House in the first quarters in New Orleans on on Iberville Street. Um, One of the most famous places down there for getting some good oysters. Um, I was six, so I, I started busting tables um i was dishwasher first you know so i don't know if you ever saw a, a dishwashing area in the restaurant it is not made for a guy who's six six <laughs> over no it's not <laughs> yes yeah, so i went home with a lot of cuts and scrapes and bruises um uh, i had my first daughter um she's 21 now had my first daughter um during that time um then it was time so i worked there for two years um took care of my mother t- took care of my father took care of my brother, you know, my, my, my daughter. Uh, I did everything I, I had to do working that job, working double shifts, busting my butt for two years. Um, what's crazy is um, I grew from 6'9 to 6'9 six, 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 over that two-year period uh, in between school. So it's actually, you know, it kind of worked out for me, you know. So I went from an undersized um, big man who probably wasn't going to get too many D1 offers to a legitimate, you know, 6'9 power forward. Um, he didn't play any ball during that time, though. Um, but I was working, you know, coming home. And, and one day, man, I, I came home and um, I had my second daughter um, while I was in school. But one day I came home and I was smelling like shrimp, you know, um, it's like, and my daughter was still up. And I went to give her a hug and she was like, oh, that, that's, thank you. And I was like, man, I can't, I can't, this can't be me. This can't be who I'm going to be. And so, just so happened, like two weeks later, um, you know, my dad, you know, he was he was like, he's healed up. He's going to be able to go back to work. My mother was going to be able to go to back, back to work. So they was going to be fine. You know, I didn't want to leave them unless they was going to be okay. Yeah. So that was my main thing. Um, so I talked to a guy named Glenn Amatrot. Uh, Glenn Amatrot, he's the um, he's with the GM there. Um, and now he's the uh, GM at, uh, at Mahoney's Pool Boys down in New Orleans. It's an amazing spot. Um, and... He was like, man, you need to go back. To, you need to go to college. You know, this is not this is not who you should be. You're you're bigger than this. Oh. And so I talked to my guy, Coach Glenn Ciprin, uh, who was the head coach at a couple of schools, and my mentor, my high school coach's best friend, and still to this day, I, I lean on both of them, my high school coach and him. And I said, hey, man, I need to get in school. And he was like, okay. He called me the next day. I got a school. It says Independence Community College in Canton. And I said, all right. And I, was, and I was like, well, what do I need to do? He's like, I got your flight. 
and you know, it because it was like right when school was about to start. You know, uh, it was like August two thousand and one, August like twenty something two thousand and one. Um, so I got there, uh, got to school. Um, it snowed. I didn't have any. I didn't know what what, what was that. What was snow coming from Louisiana? <laughs> uh, then the next week, um, um, you know, nine eleven hit. You know, um, so like you know. I'm just lost. I don't know what's going on in the world. You know, it's you know it's you know it's no internet then, so it's just you looking at it. So it, it was kind of kind of weary, you know. Looking back on it, um, played one year there, transferred to another school, uh, another college, junior college, because um, at that school in Kansas, if anybody know about the Jayhawk Junior College Conference, you're not allowed to get a full scholarship. You know, oh. your, your 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 scholarship had to pay for your uh, room and board or something like that. But I had a, you know, I had a kid, so I needed to, I needed my full scholarship. Yeah. So I got went to Swinson Junior College, went to Fort Smith, got the full scholarship. That way, I was able to send my Pell Grant home, you know. Um. So sending my Pell Grant home, got the full scholarship. I was doing good, you know. Had another baby. Um. So I got a four year old, one year old now. Well, three, two, one. I can't think of the, the you know, years in the range. Went to do Division One school. I wanted to be closer to home. I went to Southeastern Louisiana University, like forty-five minutes from New Orleans. Um, I was, you know, down there. Um, it's crazy. Tell you, it's crazy story. How you know I was trying to take care of my family so much. Um, I was on full scholarship, getting Pell Grant, and taking out student loans mm. to send home money to take care of everybody. You know, mm. it was my responsibility. Once I did it at sixteen, everybody just leaned on me. You know. Um, which was fine. And so I, you know, I, I don't take, I don't say that as a negative thing. Um, it just was my, it was the cards I was built, you know, and you know, I'm a, I'm a good space player, so I wasn't tripping. Um, so, so, you know, I, I went, I went out and uh, I did my thing, you know, did all the accolades in college and made all of the, the great decisions in school and, um, took the, had the best record ever for the school. Um, the next year went to the NCAA tournament, you know, we lost, um, I, you know, I had agents calling. I was going to be drafted. Mm. So, you know, I made the dumb decision of dropping out of classes to work out. Um, I only had a semester left to finish. I could have finished my school and worked out. Then I got hurt in the gym, open gym. Oh. No one even touched me. You know, LCL, MCL. And so leg was messed up. Um, it was t- it was coming to time to work out. I couldn't work out for the pre-draft. I had to heal. I had some workouts. I worked out with the Raptors, the Spurs, and the, um, what now Pelicans was then Hornets. Um, my, my agent got me in those workouts. Physically, I did well, but I couldn't pass it physical. You know, I know if we had doctors going to pass me with my knee swollen after every workout. Yeah. Um, so, so just got better that summer and said, you know what, I was going to try to go overseas and play. Uh, went to this camp up in Oregon. Um, it was like uh, for the play in the Chinese Basketball Association. Oh. Um, w- had the opportunity to go over there. I went home. It was August 27th, 2005. Um, so I was driving on the interstate. My dad picked me up. We was going into the city. It was the only car going into the city. Every car was coming out. Katrina was coming. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Katrina hit, lost everything. You know, long story short, well, long story even longer. We um we 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 got thirteen of us in one four F one fifty Titan V eight, um and uh, that was my dad's truck, and we um we drove to Houston, um we got to Houston, oh. uh, we got to Houston. My agent Merrill he got us um two Motel six, um rooms for thirteen people, um so then he called me a couple of days later. The Globe Trotters in town along with the NBA doing, um, it was doing a charity event for the survivors of Hurricane Katrina, you know, putting on shows or whatever. And my agent was like, hey, you want to come in and, and go work out? I was like, yeah, it's 13 of us in two rooms. I haven't slept in <laughs> I'm out. four days. <laughs> what? Yes, I want to do anything, you know? Yeah. But, uh, and so um, I called my, one of my, my college teammates who's now the, um, he's the coach at, um, I can't think of the school right now. It's, it's slipping. I don't know why. But, um, He's a head coach now, um, uh, Amir Abdul Rahim. Um, he, um, his brother Sharif Abdul Rahim, played for um, the Nuggets, played for the Grizzlies and Sacramento Kings. He's mm-hmm. now on the commissioner of the G League right now. He's like wow. the 
and silver G League now. But anyway, he still was in the league, and I called and said, "Hey man, I need some shoes. I need some shorts." Um, um, and Kennesaw, Kennesaw State is the co- school that Amir is the head coach at. I don't know why that slipped my mind. And uh, Amir said, "Cool, I'm gonna call Reef, and we're gonna get you some stuff." Reef sent me some shoes, sent me some shorts. I went and, and worked out. I thought it was just a workout, but it was a tryout. Oh. Um, out Manny Jackson, who's the owner of the team at the time, first African American to own a, um, a, a, a professional uh, sports team. Um, I met him at his room at the Hyatt that night, uh, which, you know, staying in the Motel 6, it was like I was walking to <laughs> Disney World. Yeah. And um, he gave me a contract that night. And, wow. Um, yeah, he gave me a contract that night. And he was like, and that was the most money, like, my, you know, my mom and dad couldn't make that in five years, you know. And it was only, it was an $85,000 contract. Um, and he gave me a $12,000 moving bonus. And it was like, I had to move. We just had a bag. I had a bag, you know. So he like he was really just giving me twelve thousand dollars. So that was that was that was awesome, you know. And um, moved to Phoenix um because the team was based in Phoenix at the time. Okay. And you know now, seventeen, eighteen, however many years later, you know, uh, I've did a couple of TV shows. I've been to ninety countries. Um, um, met my wife on the road. Got two more boys. Um. I've got another one on the way. My wife's like three, 50, 16 weeks pregnant right now, I think. Okay. Um, 16 or 18. I can't remember because the, the, everything's backed up on getting appointments. So, I, you know, I used to go off what appointment this is. <laughs> yeah. 16 weeks, 18. So I'm kind of two weeks off either way. So I hope she don't hurt me. Um, <laughs> and uh, just loving life, man. I did the amazing race three times. Um, I met the Pope. You know, you know, I just, just hung out with Snoop Dogg a couple weeks ago. Um, all right, Peter Snoop Dogg, his mom just passed. Um, so I just, it just, uh, I just, you know, live the life you can write a book on, you know, uh, I've enjoyed it. And, um, uh, now I am, uh, um, you know, I've been licensed as a realtor yeah. for six years. Um, I'm with Remax Momentum in Colorado now, doing that now train. I just got yesterday, somebody called me to come train their kid and, you know, everything I do is about giving back, you know? So yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm doing, I'm just doing it. I'm just loving life and. Just enjoy my family. How were you able to balance all of this? I mean, traveling to 90 countries, uh-huh. you know, you're doing the shows for the Globetrotters. You're a father. You're a husband. You know, you're a real estate agent. How in God's name do you balance all of that, Nate? Well, you know, like I said, my, my dad was on drugs. He was an alcoholic. And he worked 14-hour shifts. Yeah. And he was living in the projects. And every day we would have gunshots. So for me to, you know, be married, uh, with going on five kids, my wife's a doctor, um, I get to travel the world, um, I get to help people find homes, mm-hmm. you know, and, 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 and do amazing stuff on that level. I get to train kids, I get to do basketball camps in the neighborhood. Um, it could be worse. It, it could, could be, be worse. worse. Uh-huh. So, so for me, it's a, I'm, I'm blessed. I, I'm blessed to be able to do any one of the things that I'm able to do. You know, I'll be, I would be happy with just being a great father. That sure. that's it. If you just can say, Nate, you gotta give everything up and be a great father. I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. You know, but um, I strive to be a great father, a great husband, a great person. Um, you know, and make sure everybody that I come in contact walk away with man. I really enjoy my time meeting him. Or whether it's in the airport, sure. the laundromat, you know, clean, it don't matter, you know, and, and that I think that's easy. You are a force physically to be recognized. Uh, yeah. And so, but you become, now, when we talked previously, we were kind mm-hmm. of preparing for the show, you know, you said, uh, I'm, I'm about to go to training camp to get, you know, back mm-hmm. in shape to, to go ahead and, and yeah. tour with the Globetrotters. And uh, I, I said to you, you know, well, what is it like, you know, having to try to keep up with all the young kids? Do you remember what you said to me? I probably say uh, what it's like for them to keep up with me. That's if, exactly. if, I, if I know, and I don't remember, but that's I, exactly I what you said. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, you know, I talk crazy to them. I let them know, like, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, it, I, I rather, my thing is I rather shut a throne. I tell them all the time, like it, it shouldn't be lonely at the top. We all can sit up here yeah. and be bosses on the top of the throne. Um, but you ain't gonna knock me off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you ain't knock me off. I'm, I'm up here until I'm ready to roll. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That was fun. Went to camp. It was the first time doing some shows after 18 months hiatus yeah. from COVID. So it was good to see my teammates. Good to see the fans. You know, yeah. it got cut short. 
but it was awesome. You know, it was awesome. I, I was happy. I was afraid that COVID was going to retire me. So yeah. it was awesome to get back out there again. So if anything happened from here, at least I did it my way, you know? Well, but that's the interesting thing is, is the impact that you make and, and, and you do this night after night after night. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not going to just talking about with the globe trotters. I'm talking about the right. fact that, you know, you're doing it with helping people find houses in the basketball camps that you run for the kids locally and all of mm -hmm. that stuff. I, I get that it could be worse. I get uh -huh. that you saw a work ethic, but mm -hmm. I want step out of that for a minute and look at yourself okay. in the mirror and say, okay, if I was able to distill my level of drive, mm -hmm. where does that power come from? Um, it comes, it comes from, it comes from wanting everybody around me to be happy. Right. It comes from wanting my kids not to want for anything. It comes from wanting my wife to not to want for anything. And my mother, um, it comes from, um, you know, I've seen, like I said, since six years old, murder, 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 mayhem, you know? So it comes from like, okay, you're lucky to be here. Don't waste it. Mm -hmm. Don't waste it. You could have been the one that got shot in the courtyard when you was 13. You know, you could have one that took that bullet to the head, to the back of the head, standing in the bar. You could have been the one when they pull up to rob the heroin side and they pick the wrong side of the project. They got shot with the with the shot the, the shotgun. So you wasn't. There's some reason you here. Have fun and go have fun. Why waste it? Like who cares about anything? You know, like like uh, you know, there's a guy I grew up with named Sadie, and he always said. Money come and go. And you never really realize that, you know, it's easy when you don't have money to say that, right? Yeah. And so then when you get money and you realize like, okay, like, yeah, this is awesome. Money is going to open so, so many doors. It's done, it does a lot. It enables you to do some things. Don't get me wrong. But it's not the end all be all, you know? Like right now, I'm about to coach my son's basketball team, mm -hmm. you know? That is that right there makes me so happy that I'm going to be home to coach his basketball team. My dad only came to maybe two games my whole life because he was working. Yeah, you know, and it was you know it was it was a, my senior my senior day and one more game when we played in New York when we played against Tulane in New Orleans. You know, so and now now he wanted to I'm sure he did you know I'm because he he I love, but. I don't get to go. I'm going to my son's soccer practice. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm getting to do so many things. So for me, it's like I get to do all these things. It's a you know, it's a blessing, and it's a, it's you know, I'm lucky to be able to do them. So I'm gonna do them at the highest level. No one's gonna be better at doing none of these things I'm doing. You can't mess with me. I don't care what you say because <laughs> I'm a dog. I'm a yeah. beast. You know, I'm a dog. Don't nothing. Nothing is what it what it is you know it's just you know it's a, a negotiation for a house it's uh you know, you know I'm, I'm trying to when in college you know i'm trying to you know score whatever i'm trying to i come from my mentality is different when i was in college i was trying to take care of a whole entire family three generations of people i was in charge of you know i had to feed them so that rebound is just a rebound to you for me, that's my livelihood. Yeah, you know, so I'm playing for life. But everything I do is for life, and I enjoy it though. Yeah. And I want to pass it down. I want these kids to see that you could come from where I come from and, and be from where they're from, and still be great and still be a good person. You don't have to well, be a I, bad person. I want to talk to you about that because so in preparing for this, uh, you know, I I take a lot of time to really mm -hmm. distill my thoughts. And and I was on the fence to ask you this question, but you go just ahead, opened the door. So I'm well, and you told me I could ask you whatever. So I don't care. <laughs> how do you balance the reality that you had growing up and how that really contributed so strongly to your life's vision? And how do you translate that into kids who don't get it at all? who that has not been their reality, that has not, your reality uh, mm -hmm. living in New Orleans in the projects is not mm -hmm. a reality that anybody uh, that you've surrounded mm -hmm. with yourself right now really is experienced, uh -huh. not to that level, Nate. How do you communicate right. that to make people get it? Well, that's the hard, that's my hardest job, right? 
my hardest job right now is for for my own kids. Right. And for your kids, I'm sure how you grew up, no matter how it was, you wanted to provide better for your kids, right? Absolutely. You want them to be better than you, right? Yeah. So for me, I just say about kids I'm trying to help on the street. You know, had pale boys and girl, boys and girl club, whatever I'm doing, right? Whatever I'm at, or just a kid standing in front of the grocery store. If I have to figure out as a leader, as a human being, as a man, as a mentor, how to bottle up what I've been through and maneuver it for it to relate to what they're going through. Absolutely. Right? So I grew up to where if I didn't play basketball, I was probably going to die. Basketball saved my life. Mm -hmm. Right. They don't have that same thing. You know, they might be paying their parents are paying whatever amount of money for me to train them. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I'm training them. Right. So they want me to put that killer into their son or daughter. That's the toughest thing I tell people. Like, listen, I can't put something in them that not in them. And you should want that in them. For me, I look at, you know, my daddy told me, you know, the Globetrotters, my first year, second year, um, you know, I got, I got, um, let go by um, the guy who was working with the team at the time. It was a little snake, you know, he did a snake move and they fell for it. And I got fired my, oh. my first in the team. And my dad told me, he was like, like Nate, he was like, you made it through New Orleans in the nineties. You didn't go to jail. You didn't sell drugs. You didn't die. Mm -hmm. He was like, every move you made, cause it was based off of those three things. I don't want to die. I don't want to go to jail, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I and I don't want to sell drugs. That's not who I am. So move accordingly. Treat everything the same. You know, don't treat because you're doing this corporate thing, you know, still treat it how you grew up. So I, I grab. So everything I do now, I use the rules of, the, of those streets that I, I grew up in and I, I, and I was able to get around without getting in no trouble. That is a feat. I, that should be yeah. one of my Guinness World Record records. I got two of them. <laughs> that should be my third one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, going up in a project and not going to jail. But anyway, so what I try to do is try to find something that I can, they can relate to that I can relate to. You know, I try to talk to them. I try to sit down with them and just hear them out, you know, because, yes, I've been through this extreme stuff, like super extreme stuff. Um, and they might just, just be going through having some mental health issues. They might sure. be going through 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 something, you know, small parents divorce or anything. So, you know, this kid having mental health issues because his parents divorcing and he's still multi millionaire, whatever, is not the same as me watching two friends die, right? But mental health issues are mental health issues. I yep. still have to deal with this. You know, and he has to deal with that. So now we got to find, like, listen, I know this is not that, but this is how I dealt with this situation. So I want you to figure out how you can deal with this situation, okay? So sit down, let's relax, let's, let's go talk to a therapist, you know? Mm -hmm. Let's find somebody to, to, to get this out of your system and help you in that way. Because I'm not, I, I'll never attempt to be a therapist or be sure. I'm me. You know, right. I'm, 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 you know, so I try to push them in the right direction and give them all the tools to, to help them. I, it's still tough, though. It's tough for me because I'm like, well, man, I wish I had the opportunity. And that's how I look at yeah. it. I wish I had the opportunity. I wish I had my mom, how I had a whatever truck or whatever or an endless amount of this and none of that. But you know what it helped me realize, helped me realize as a as a man? Everybody has issues. Yeah. It doesn't matter. If you're sitting over here with this golden egg or you're sitting over here with a cracked egg, we all have issues. So I enjoyed my childhood. Sure. I, I, I love my friends from my childhood. I wish the violence and stuff was taken out of my childhood. Mm -hmm. I would go back and live that same way, poor and everything, if nobody had to die. Yeah. Because other than that, the lessons I learned growing up in that, in that neighborhood, in that city, is the reason I'm here. The reason I am such a, I, I, I am perceived to be such a great person. I am a good man, a good husband and all that. It's because of the crazy stuff I saw growing up. It wasn't because sure. of nothing I learned in college. It wasn't because of, you know what I'm saying? It was because mm -hmm. everything that happened to me before I was 21, you know? Yeah. Now you just dropped something that I have to pick back up, which is that you have two Guinness records. What, what, mm -hmm. what? 
Yes, I got um, I got a Guinness World Record for the farthest hook shot, and I got a Guinness World Record for the farthest blindfolded hook shot. Yeah, <laughs> ah. yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, sir. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. That's I, cool. I, they call me That's... Hook, hook, hook shot king. Hook shot king. Wow. <laughs> now, uh, let's continue on this this life of of ever changing learning and perspective that mm-hmm. that you have. Ninety countries. Yes, right? sir. Over what, I don't know what for sure. What is one of the biggest takeaways that you had from, I mean, I, I don't know. And you're the only person I've ever met, Nate, just so you know, who's yeah. vis- visited over 90 countries ever. Like I'm, uh-huh. you're the only person in my whole life. And so now that I have your attention, <laughs> what, <laughs> what, what, what is one of the biggest things that you gleaned from doing all of that traveling? I'm going uh, to tell you two things. All right. Okay. First, after I got with the team, after the, after Katrina, right. And I saw a lot of stuff. I saw bodies tied to stop signs because the morgue was underwater and it was flooding, right? It was just, it was unbelievable living those couple of days we did stay down there, right? My first trip out the country was to India. Oh. I went to Chennai, India. Chennai, India. It was hot. And it looked like they was living in Katrina every day. Oh. What I had just went through in that small moment of time, you know, which, which was, don't get me wrong, I'm not downplaying it. It was traumatic. It was the worst thing that ever happened to me. You know, um, those people was living that every day, but they were the happiest, nicest, giving, loving people I have still ever encountered in my time. And I was like, man, you know, I called home to my little brother and I said, man, we just went through some stuff and we're going to bounce back and we're going to be all right. And we already blessed now, you know, God bless me with this job and, able to help, whatever. I'm like, but these people, this is what they, this is like, this is it for them. So what we saw in Katrina, I saw it 20 times worse. And the kids were smiling. The adults were happy, you know? And I was like, wow, like, like okay, I need to change how, how I think about stuff, what, what the material things really mean to me. You know, it's about finding that inner happiness, no matter what the situation is. And also, when I was doing the Amazing Race, the first time I did, I did it three times. I was traveling, we was going around the world, and, and, and sometimes you can stop and you can ask somebody to help you out, give you a yeah. dollar or two to get a burger, whatever. Yeah. Um, that's how the game was, right? Anybody who was dressed nice, who had was in big cars or whatever, did not help us. People who had nothing standing on the sidewalk or walking or, 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 or were dirt poor would buy us a burger, a milkshake. Um, one guy even bought us a beer, you know, huh. and, um, yeah, so I was like, wow, you know, and cause on the race, I, all my worldly possessions, I can't, I can't take my credit card, debit card. None of that means nothing. I'm broke out here. Whatever they give me for that leg of the race is what I had. So if we want to get a, something to eat extra, you know, we would have to, you know, work out magic and, you know, ask people for help and never was helped by a person in a three piece suit. Or, or, or some beautiful high heel shoes. There's always somebody who was, you know, working class, walking to work on the train or whatever, that would stop and give us a coin or something to help us buy that burger. And so it made me realize, like, don't judge not one single person by what you see. Judge by what they do. Whatever they show you is what you judge it on. Forget the outside. Get to know somebody. Talk to them. See how how you how you. I go, see the, the up, the down, the lows, stuff get real, see how they're going to react. Don't just go off of, um, hey, this person looks nice, drive a nice car. That means nothing. That doesn't mean they're a good person. Yeah. Why real estate? That just seems well, like a jump to me, Nate. I don't know. Like, <laughs> all of the other stuff, and I'm like, okay, now, okay. But like, but it, it help us with that. That's That seems to be an interesting life transition for you. Where did that come from and why did that happen? So um, my, my mentor I talked to earlier, he was coaching at Oklahoma State. You know, he did he coached at different uh, places. Um, he um, he has a lot of rental problems in New Orleans. Oh. And so probably about 10 years ago, he said, um, Nate, um, when you retire, you should get into real estate, buy some rental properties, um, so forth and so on. I said, okay, cool. Um, and um, I was like, but if well, I am, I was like, well, I want to learn about it. So I'm going to get my license and I'm going to be a real, a real estate agent. And that way no one can 
do play no games and mm-hmm. pull one over on me. Again, I grew up, you know, I got that mentality yeah. from growing up in the project now. So now everything I do, I'm trying to get ahead of the game. So I was like, okay, like I don't want to be a person trying to buy this rental property and this agent getting over or whatever. So I wanted to learn. So I went to, I went to, you know, I did my classes and everything, got my license. Um, initially, it was just to get to get the license, to get the information, to be able to be inside the MLS and you know see stuff that normal people can't see. Mm-hmm. But uh, so, I, but so one this lady called me. She she looked me up on the website. Um, she was living in the night. She she had a had a, a place in the night war New Orleans um, duplex. And um, she was like, I want you to uh, rent it out for me. I was like, okay, cool. Like, well, I was home. Like, I, wa- I wasn't going to be leaving for about three months. So, I love, I should have enough time to, to, to do it. That's why I never would really take any listings because I can fly to go see the Pope tomorrow, yeah. you know? And I didn't want to do no anybody that. So, I was doing it, and um, one young lady came. She wanted to see the, the, uh, the house. And I was like, okay, I'll meet you over there. She didn't have an agent. I got over there, opened the door for her. She was her and her son. She was a single mother. And she was like, oh, look at those floors. And it was wood, it was reefer, it was wood floors originally. The house was like a 1920s house, beautiful re- uh, remodeled home. And um, her son said, mama, he was probably like six. He was like, oh, the refrigerator is silver. You know, it never saw standing still, you know? And, um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I said, and I looked at her, and she was like, well, I'm going to have to do this. And I, cause, you know, I was running the credit checks and I was doing everything. And uh, I said, okay. And so um, she was like, man, this would be so awesome for him to live somewhere like this. And, you know, we, we living with my aunt right now. And I was like, where they live at? And she told me where they live at. It was a project. Mm-hmm. It was, uh, and I was like, man. And she was like, you know, I'm just getting out of college and I'm just getting, getting my job and I'm trying to do better for him. And that hit hard. Yeah. That hit hard for me, you know. I never had wood floors. I never, I had, I never had a dishwasher or nothing until I was paying for it, you know, me and my wife, you know. And so I understood that, and I was like, man, I didn't see none of this stuff till I got in my twenties. If I could help her show her son this at six years old, mm-hmm. how good would he be when he get in his twenties, you know? So you know, I want like, wow, that's cool. So I sat down. I talked to the lady who owned the home, and I said, listen. I want to, I understand she's not the most qualified, but if we can, I want to give her a chance. And she was mm-hmm. like, well, why, Nate? And I told her the story. She started crying because <laughs> she was a black lady, you know, and there was a young black girl. And she was like, of course, let's do it. Mm-hmm. And so I said, listen, if anything happened, um, you know, I'll pay for the damages, you know, for the, uh, for the first year. Wow. And um, and she was like, no, you don't have to do that. I said, no, I just, I, how much I, I, or whatever and um and so after that i was like man like okay th- this is this is cool you know i can meet a lot of people which i do already mm-hmm. uh, i can impact families and kids which i do already so i was like man um when i finish playing i can still be fulfilled yeah and and financially be stable you know so um that's why I chose real estate initially, wow. you know, and, um, and, you know, first it was just to, you know, get the knowledge. Then when I realized people really can, 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 you can really help them. That's awesome. Like I, I, right now, this young lady right now, um, she's, she's um, 20 years old. She will be the first person in her family to own a home. Um, oh. um, um, yeah. Yeah. She had family come, came, came over from Mexico when she was younger. And um, so like I'm fighting for her you know, with the loan offer. So let's get her qualified, and we're going to get her. We're probably going to get our house this weekend when we go out. Wow. Um, she just got qualified for some more money, and and that's you know I'm not going to make a crazy amount of money off that deal, um, but I'm going to get, I'm going to feel I feel so good now telling you about it because I know like I'm I'm about to change her her life trajectory. I'm about to change yeah. when she started family. They have they own something, you know, and so it's like like I'm going to help her get that. So for me, now it's I'm, it's still the same thing, you know. I'm still helping people when I get in front of the other agent. I'm performing, you know. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, and and I know I'm going to change a couple of lives. So that, that's why I real estate. I am sure that there are people who are listening to the show right now or watching the show who are going to want to, I don't know, 
talk to you, thank you, hire mm-hmm. you. What's the best way for people to reach out to you? And why would they reach out to you? Uh, should you just want people to, I don't know, help us with that. Man, you know, if you listen, I got so much going on right now. Like, um, you know, <laughs> um, I'm always, if you want to, you want help with, with, you know, getting a house, selling your home in, in the Colorado area, hit me up. Um, I got basketball camps um, coming up. I got one coming up with the, with the, with the rec center, the Paul, Paul Dura, the rec center in Broomfield. Um, um, I'm training kids again, uh, basketball season starting up. Um, the, the assistant principal just called me at one of the schools and said, Hey, man, can you train my son? So, you know, I'm gonna do that. Um, go to my, go to my Instagram, go to my Twitter, um, you know, uh, Facebook, um, just follow me, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm about, you know, family, you know, family and fun, you know? Um, yeah, just hit me up on any one of those things. You want to holler at me, ask me a question. You know, I, I, I enjoy life. You know, I just went down to you know, New Orleans and helped out with the relief from Hurricane Ida, you know, with the, well, teamed up with Pell, the police athletic league, and gave away grills and tents and stuff that you wouldn't think people need. You know, they hadn't had power for so many days. So it was awesome to go and do that. Um, I just did a kids camp at, at the daycare. Um, yeah, man, I got a lot going on. Um, but right now, my main thing is, is, is the real estate. So hit me up, man. I'd love to work with anybody, help them out, and, and, and help their dream come true. That's awesome. Well, Nate, I want to thank you so much for not only everything that you've done, but but giving us the gift of your time for a few minutes today. So thanks for being on the show, man. Hey, man, thanks for having me. It, it was it was fun. I, I hope um, my story was, was someone that would help at least one person out there, and then they could pass it down. Something that I just heard that I want to kind of say as our closing here is, uh, when you, when you know how to fight and you flip that so that you don't have to fight for yourself anymore, but you keep that fight in you and you fight mm-hmm. for others to make other people's lives better. That's a reason to live. And that's one of the reasons why I think you impact so many people and, and people are drawn to you. So I want everybody listening right now and watching, think about that. How can you take that fight that you've had for whatever reason and turn that into something where you can help fight for others to have a better life? And if everybody did that, could you imagine what this world would be like? All right. So for Nate, Big Easy Lofton and all of us here at Proud Mouth, thank you very much for your time. And we'll see you on the other side of the mic very soon.